paramilitaries from one of Sudan's warring factions have broken into a number of jails and released prisoners. The freed detainees include suspected war criminal Ahmad Haroun, who the International Criminal Court is accusing of crimes against humanity. Now, there are reports of sporadic fighting from the capital Khartoum on the second day of a three-day truce, and thousands of residents of the city have been fleeing to neighbouring countries. This is what a ceasefire looks like in Sudan. Despite promises of a 72-hour pause in fighting, more bloodshed. According to officials here at the Al Rumi Medical Center in Omdurman, two shells fell onto the building around lunchtime on Tuesday, injuring at least 20 people waiting in the seats here. Among them, a pregnant woman. All the hospitals are closed and we were still working. The business was running in a good way, but a shell came in, as you can see, and exploded. All patients who were sitting on the seats were injured below their knees. The US brokered three-day truce between the army and paramilitary rapid support forces does, however, appear to have brought some calm to the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. But many residents are still fearful to leave their homes. They've seen previous attempts to bring stability to the country largely fail since the outbreak of fighting more than a week ago and doubt this time will be different. And at a meeting of the UN Security Council on Tuesday, the UN Special Envoy to Sudan raised further questions about the two sides' commitment to peace. The two generals continue trading accusations and issuing competing claims of control over key installations. There is yet no unequivocal sign that either is ready to seriously negotiate, suggesting that both think that securing a military victory over the other is possible. The shaky ceasefire has allowed many countries to carry out mass evacuations, like Saudi Arabia, which brought over a 1,000 people from more than 50 countries by boat to Jeddah. The thousands are also fleeing across Sudan's borders, leading to fears of this crisis spreading into neighboring countries. Many of them arriving in makeshift camps in Chad, desperate for food, water and medical attention, with the UN warning of the urgent need for aid and resources to help deal with the growing influx of people. For more on this story, we can speak to Abiel Luel Deng. She's an international development consultant who's following what's happening right now in Sudan. Welcome to DW. We're, we're hearing that Sudan's paramilitary rapid support forces, the RSF, RSF, have broken into several prisons, including Cobra Prison, where um, ICC wanted prisoners were being held. And we're hearing that some detainees have been released. Can you help explain to us why the RSF would do this? Yes, um, well, it's nice to be here. Um, honestly, the reports are a bit conflicting because other reports have stated that it wasn't RSF, it was uh, the SAF, but most of the reports have stated that it was the RSF that uh, liberated them. And there could be a number of reasons, but it is um, if it is the RSF, the main reasons would be that um, they have allegiances to certain people who are detained, um, such as uh, perhaps Ahmed Haroun, um, they also would be perhaps looking to create chaos. Um, perhaps if they feel that they're losing a bit ground, the, they might go and find some people who are former military or former paramilitary who might be able to, to join them um, or to, who might be willing to uh, broker, some, uh, broker some power in their favor with maybe certain ethnic groups or in, within certain areas. So for the RSF, if they did indeed break into these prisons, it could be a power play to further destabilize uh, the SAF's credibility and hold on, on the country. We're in day two of a three-day truce. It remains extremely fragile, reports of continuing airstrikes. So, so why is it so impossible for these warring generals to hold a 72-hour truce? Well, I think it's just as the UN envoy for Sudan said, there is no genuine desire uh, to reach a deal. Each side really wants to come out 
um, on top. And even if there are concessions to be made, it's clear that they are, uh, that both generals uh, and both factions are unwilling to be the side that has to make the most strategic concessions. And frankly, I think that they probably think that they can still win uh, to a certain extent uh, this battle. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, and so I think that's probably one of the reasons why. And lastly, I would say that just due to the nature of this urban fighting, um, particularly also with paramilitaries fighting and in areas with civilians in a country in which many civilians are armed, uh, it must also be quite difficult for them to stop uh, the fighting as well. So, so no appetite for peace. How high is the risk of this conflict spreading through the region, would you say? It's incredibly high. Um, I would say at the highest, um, we do know that they're already, uh, that the Chadian government has announced that they disarmed uh, several hundred um, uh, armed uh, people. We don't know to which faction they belonged who tried to cross the border. Um, we know clearly of the history of Sudan and South Sudan tensions and uh, the disputed area, uh, Abye, which is in between the two countries, where the last, uh, the, which was the last time the two countries uh, fought. There could also uh, perhaps be a reawakening of that conflict or and even just uh, tension within South Sudan due to the large number of South Sudanese refugees in Sudan who will now need to uh, likely go back. Then there's also obviously the Ethiopian uh, Tigre uh, conflict, uh, which could also reignite uh, mm -hmm. with more armed actors in the area. Yeah. An extremely uh, concerning situation. Abiyol Luel Deng, an international development consultant, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. As we just heard there, the 72-hour ceasefire in Sudan has provided an opportunity for many countries to undertake mass evacuations by road, air and sea. Now, this includes Germany, which has now ended its evacuation operation after helping more than 700 people flee the country. That included around 200 German citizens, according to the German Defence Ministry. Now, Maximilian Rutka works for the German cultural organization, the Goethe Institute. He was based in Sudan, but he was just evacuated and he arrived back in Berlin on Monday. Welcome to DW, Mr. Rutka. Can you tell us about your experience of being evacuated from Khartoum? How, how difficult was it to get out? Yeah, the most difficult thing was probably to overcome the fear of leaving the house for the first time after eight days of hiding and sheltering. Um, but, um, yeah, that day the streets were relatively calm, so we were able to go to the assembly point and from there it went somewhat smoothly and we were able to go to the airstrip and, um, in long later on, uh, take off towards so, so, Jordan. So when you say that you were, you'd been hiding inside for eight days, just tell us a little bit about that. I mean, were you, you were hearing, I presume, gunfire outside? Were you able to get out to get, to get food supplies, for example? Um, yes, well, first of all, we, we uh, were sort of uh, in a hot spot in Amarat, which is also very close to the airport, the, the international airport. And of course, we heard everything. We heard, uh, um, the bomb shells, we heard the gunfights, we heard uh, the airstrikes, everything. We smelled the smoke and, and saw the smoke. But uh, yeah, we did not see uh, much because we were hiding. Uh, we, were not, we were not allowed to, to go anywhere near the windows. And, um, and yet we were one of the lucky ones, my wife and I, um, because we had enough supply of food and water uh, throughout the whole time. So we didn't have to go outside, but most people um, are not in that situation and they had to go outside and it was uh, just uh, life-threatening. Yeah. Did you at any point think that you weren't going to get out, that you wouldn't be evacuated? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, of course, we didn't try, oh, we tried to not think of this scenario. I understand. Can you describe to us the situation in Sudan in past months? You were living there. What was it, what was it like when the fighting first began? I mean, everyone knew that there was some tension between the, the two conflict parties, but um, nobody would have ever expected um, you know, a catastrophe um, that 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 started on the 15th of April 
I mean, people uh, went outside in the morning to get some groceries and then came back and and everything, uh, you know, flipped upside down. And uh, we heard airstrikes, we heard gunshots, and um, you know, this 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 sort of uh, immediate change was a, a surprise and a shock to everyone. Yeah. Maximilian Rutger from the Goethe Institute, until recently living in Sudan. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Alan Boswell is Crisis Group's project director for the Horn of Africa. Why do these formerly allied generals, now enemies, engaged in a pitched battle, why, why are they unable to even hold a 72-hour truce? Uh, well, at a very top level, it does not seem like either of these two are really ready to head to talks yet. Um, on the one hand, it appears like the army is basically intent on trying to uh, to knock out the leader of their opponent to, to, to kill uh, General Hameti, um, and the uh, RSF um, under General Hameti has essentially been swarming the capital with as many fighters as he can. Um, this continues to be something of a dogfight um, between the two. There are also questions from diplomats involved in these talks about whether or not either of them has sufficient control of his forces to really make a cease fire stick. After warnings from the African Union to the UN, how high is the risk of regional spread and internationalizing this conflict? Uh, th those risks are quite high, um, and those risks um, grow the longer that this goes on. Um, I think one of the upsides uh, we've seen thus far is that uh, this has remained a battle for Khartoum. Other Sudanese uh, actors and armed groups, and there are many other armed groups in Sudan, they have rejected this war as catastrophic and and uh, meaningless and needless. Um, the longer this goes on, the greater the risk that this uh, spreads that this becomes a much more complicated conflict, um, that it sucks in external actors as well. Um, and then that'll not only affect the broader region and countries, um, it'll also just make it much more difficult to resolve. What is then the way to bring this battle to an end? Uh, somehow, you're going to have to get these two men uh, to stop fighting. Um, most of these uh, high-level power politics efforts right now are taking place between Washington um, and the Arab Gulf. Uh, Saudi Arabia is taking a lead, more or less, on that side. There are, of course, a lot of African initiatives, uh, too, um, but the, the general um, assumption has been that the real leverage of these two probably lies uh, in the Gulf, um, as well as in Washington. Um, but what it'll take to actually get them to stop fighting is difficult to say. Part of the problem here um, is, of course, people want to uh, threaten them with punitive action, but you also somehow have to talk them down from the ledge. Um, so, as always in these situations, it's um, it's a bit of a dirty game. Well, in talking them down, does the international community stand a chance of mediating uh, some sort of end to this conflict? Uh, yes, uh, we do think they can. Uh, there are there is leverage over these two um, if if people are really uh, willing to use it. Um, but that will only really work once these two have reached some sort of um, conclusion that you know perhaps they're fighting themselves to a bit of a draw or they see a reason to go to the negotiating table. Um, the hope would be that they get there soon, um, or that some of these threats on these two start to. Um, you know, start to really make some headway. Um, they still are in a mindset of a very early conflict in which they both still think they can win. Um, and the question is just how long is this going to continue before they start to change their calculus? Good question. Alan Boswell, Horn of Africa Director at Crisis Group. Thank you very much for the insight. Thank you.